All right, our opening song is by Jennifer McMillan and you'll want, if you have the screen so you can see more people than the slides, you're gonna to wanna to pull it the other way so you can see the slide really big because this is really pretty and creative. It touched my heart so much. So I offer you Jennifer McMillan singing, come, come, whoever you are. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come, 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 whoever you are, wanderer, come, worshiper, come, lover you of leaving, ours is no caravan. Good morning and uh, welcome to Westwood. We pause to affirm that the land that we gather on has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality and continues to do so. Amiskawasan Hatihin, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills House, is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional gathering place and home to diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Lakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Sotu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. I acknowledge my role as a treaty person and feel continuously called to explore what that means and how to be a responsible and respect respectful ally. I encourage each of you to seek understanding on how to be curious and respectful allies and treaty people. My name is Lee Bourne and I am your service leader this morning. Thanks to Jennifer McMillan, our musician today, Elara Stefania Gadet for the story of all ages and Reverend Ann Barker, our Westwood Unitarian minister. So, now is the time for our shared chalice lighting. If you have a chalice or a candle handy, I invite you to bring it forward. These are the words of the Reverend Francis Manley. This is the time of waiting. This is the time of darkness. This is the time of coming to birth. Let the jingle bells be silent. Let the glaring lights and the bright colors go dim for they herald a season that is not here yet. This is the time of turning inward. This is the time of longing. This is the time of preparing. This is the time of waiting. What do you long for, O oh my soul? What do you long for? Nothing the eyes can see, nothing the hands can touch, nothing the ears can hear. What do you long for, O oh my soul? Where will you find it, O oh my soul? Where will you find it? Deep, 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 down in the dark, in the silence beyond all words, beyond all thought. It will find you, O oh my soul. It will find you when the time is ripe, when you have given yourself to the dark, to the silence, to the waiting. This is the time of waiting. This is the time of darkness. This is the time of coming to birth. Thank you. This morning, please share with our members and friends the lighting of candles, a most beloved sharing of our joys and concern via the chat. 
And so Jennifer McMillan will play Dona Nobis Pacham. I light one final candle for joys and sorrows left unspoken and that we carry in our hearts. We will now read our affirmation. And you can read it along silently at home. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving, affection, and trusting hope. This is the season of anticipation, the marking of time leading up to an expected event. Here at Westwood, we are marking the weeks leading up to winter solstice, the turning of the earth, which places us at the farthest angle from the sun, the shortest day and the longest night of the year. Following the candle of hope, we light the candle of peace. The candle of peace represents the promise of peace in the world and in our lives. We light this candle in the south, the direction associated with the element of fire, the desire for life and the direction of the heart. We acknowledge our needs for life and love and focus our efforts towards being effective ambassadors of peace. And now we will um, uh, have Alara Stefanik Gadet do the children's story, the child, the um, story for all ages. So it's all off to Alara and friends. Hello, friends. My name is Elm the Fairy, and my pronouns are she and her, and it's so lovely to see all of your beautiful faces out there today. Aw, thank you, Elm. My name is Alara. I use they, them pronouns, and I work with our kids and youth here at Westwood Unitarian, and I'm also really happy to see all of your faces out there today. How are you today, Elm? Well, Alara, I'm, I'm actually feeling really, really 
grateful today. Oh, that's so lovely to hear. And what is it that's making you feel extra grateful right now? I mean, there's a lot of hard things going on right now, especially at this time of year. So maybe if you share some of the things that are helping you feel grateful, it'll help us feel a little lighter too. Oh, oh, there's so many things, Alara. You know, I was feeling really sad for a long time because I'm not used to being here yet, but Spruce is such a lovely friend and Erm is always very curious and wants to hear all of my stories from Fairyland and that makes me feel really welcome. And there's also so many lovely people out there that are so welcoming and kind and it's made me start to feel a lot more at home lately and it makes me feel really, really grateful in my heart. Aw, that's really beautiful, Elm. I'm so happy to hear that, but isn't it hard just getting to know people over a screen? I mean, you haven't really been here that long. Isn't that always how things are here? I, I just thought that that was a difference between here and Fairyland. I didn't even ever haven't even seen a screen before I came here, so I just thought that that was something that was magical and special about this world. Hmm, that's a really good point. I hadn't even thought of that. You came here after we'd all been talking to each other only on screens, didn't you? Yes, I did, and I did think it was a little bit strange, but after a while I also have discovered that it's really, really beautiful how much love people can show each other through a screen, and I thought that that made things extra, extra special, and I'm really happy that I feel so welcome and loved and that everybody is so kind on the other side of the screen. I think it's something really beautiful about this world. And I'm also really grateful for all of the new friendships that I've made, and I guess I still do miss my home a little bit, but really, today, I'm honestly just feeling really happy and grateful for all of you. Aw, Elm, that's really beautiful. You know what's something that I really appreciate about our friendship? What's that, Alara? I really appreciate that we can sing together. Oh, yes, I have so many songs that I love to share with all of my friends here in this world. Elm? Yes? Would you share a song with us this today? Oh, I would love to. Okay, here, this is one of my favorite songs from this time of year. Oh, I'm excited to hear it, Elm. The darkest night is drawing near. The sky is crying frozen tears. For the light our hearts do yearn. But fear not, fear not, for the sun will always return. Oh, Elm, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much. That definitely helped me cheer up. You know, it's true that there are times and places that are good for the happy things, but there's also some times and places that help us when things feel sad. Yeah, what are some of those places, Alara? Well, for an example, next Sunday, I'm actually really looking forward to it because that did cheer me up a lot, but there are still some heavy things on my heart. So I'm looking forward to next Sunday when Anne, our minister, and Sarah, our compassion banker, are going to hold a blue Christmas service. Oh, that sounds really lovely. I think I might actually come because even though right now mostly I'm feeling grateful in my heart, there are still some hard feelings and I definitely still miss my family. I bet that everybody would be really happy to see you at that Blue Christmas next weekend. And if any of you are really having a harder time this season, we'd all love it if you could come as well. Because sometimes the best way to feel those hard and tender feelings is to spend that time together. That's right. 
I know that that's one of the reasons that I've started to feel so at home here. So I really hope that we'll see you all next week at that blue Christmas. And I think that that's our story for this morning. We're really enjoying spending our time with all of you and we love you very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again and sharing more of my sounds from Fairyland with you. Thank you, Spruce. We all appreciate you being here with us too, even if you did end up staying here by accident. Sometimes accidents can be happy things. That's very true. We love you lots. We hope you have a good rest of your week, and we'll see you at our Blue Christmas service next Sunday. And just so you know, you can see more of Spruce and friends on our YouTube page, our Facebook page, or come live to Storytime on Saturdays on Zoom. Uh, we will now hear from Jennifer McMillan, uh, Tis a Gift to be Simple. we bring to the Westwood congregation sustain us as we provide service to our members and friends alike. Please note on our screen there is ways in which you wish to donate to our church congregation to sustain us as we work through these uh, difficult times when we don't get to see each other and don't get to necessarily hear our coins clink in the offertory plate. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. So glad I didn't have to follow directly after Spruce because I had to finish crying first. I love that song. Thank or Spruce. See, now I did it. Elm, I love that song. Thank you, Elm. They say that a minister has one sermon that they preach over and over again, just in with different stories. I like to think I have maybe more than one in the rotation. But this message is a strong contender for first place and is the taproot of every seed I ever hope to plant. The world contains an abundance of evidence for both good and evil. And whatever point you wish to demonstrate regarding the goodness or the badness of humanity can likely be proven. But it is never the ultimate conclusion. It will never be true of all the beings, all the experiences or all the conclusions. So if good exists, if we can find good, shouldn't we put our attention there? Doesn't it make more sense to reinforce what is good, to give it light and nourishment and a hospitable environment most suited to its needs so that it has the best opportunity to flourish 
into its most abundant self. And if we dwell in the garden of suffering, doesn't it make sense to use our precious energy to weed out whatever is choking life and to rehabilitate the soil, even just one little tiny corner or one little tiny pot at a time to give love and light the best opportunity to put down roots. The words of Rumi translated by Daniel Ladinsky, the silkworm. I stood before a silkworm one day and that night my heart said to me, I can do things like that. I can spin skies. I can be woven into love that can bring warmth to people. I can be soft against a crying face. I can be wings that lift and I can travel on my thousand feet throughout the earth, my sacks filled with the sacred. And I replied to my heart, dear, can you really do all those things? And it just nodded, yes, in silence. So we began and will never cease. Life is not a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game is where there is a winner and a loser, or a winner and a lot of losers, but the power and the resources and the magic are finite. You win the game or you lose the game. Zero-sum is not a cooperative, collaborative effort. It is competitive in ways that assume that winning is everything and losing is for losers. It's an all in risk. There is no forgiveness and no grace. Everything is right or wrong. No complexity, no compromise, no understanding, no compassion. Religious community, on the other hand, is not a zero sum game. There might be some good spirited competition from time to time, but the work of shaping lives together toward a goal of thriving communities relies on the ideals of cooperation, sharing, compassion, and generosity. It's quite easy to understand this. I know you understand this. You demonstrate it over and over again. What's less easy is to apply it, to apply the same ideals to our own selves. Our harshest critics are ourselves. Sure, we may have created whatever poor opinions we carry of ourselves with the help of some critical others. We may carry their voices or their words in our hearts and minds and bodies. But so often it turns out to be true that the harshest judges in our lives are the ones staring back at us from the mirror, or from the little Zoom window with a death grip on self-judgment. The Christian lesson to turn the other cheek is an example of what I want to talk about this morning for your discerning, to offer it up for your discerning pleasure as a way to reconsider our tendencies toward injuring ourselves and rather to seek out both the good around and within ourselves. Try this on. One way to understand turn the other cheek would be to say that if someone harms you, you offer them the other cheek, inviting them to harm you once again. So many of us got that lesson. In the face of thine enemies, you should be steadfast, fearless, hold your ground, and refuse to strike back. Be unmoved except to offer the other cheek. Well, that sounds impossibly heroic. Who can do that? It makes me think of that epic Gandhi film. Do you remember it? That huge 14 hour marathon thing where worker after worker moved forward in the line, knowing they were lined up to be struck down by their oppressors. As a young person, I thought, how could that do anything? These people are going to be killed. The idea behind their action was to remain true to the principles of nonviolence, to be an endless force of peace. 
in passive opposition to leadership that was harming their community. I remember a gender divide in my household where turn the other cheek was concerned. It was considered a lovely little lesson that I can assure you that the women were expected to and did carry as a gospel truth. But when it came to the men, different story. The boys and men would argue that if someone hits you, of course you're going to hit them back. It was fine, according to the men, to say, don't hit people. That was a more acceptable lesson to not start a fight, but it was significantly less fine to tell them, don't hit back when someone else started it. They didn't mount a formal opposition. It was just a Sunday school lesson after all, but they didn't carry that turn the other cheek message out into the playground or into the streets. But I want to mount a defense not to accept turn the other cheek as meaning an invitation to your opponent to harm you once again. Instead, what if we take it to mean if someone harms you, give them the opportunity to make another choice, a different choice. The nonviolent Indian workers were giving their oppressors the opportunity to make a different choice, which they eventually did. If the people could not be broken down into submission by violence, if they could not be forced to go to work against their will or their conscience, if they could not be made to do the work that the ones in power wanted them to do until conditions changed, then something would have to change. They risked harm, lives were lost, but they very literally held their ground, refusing to budge until a different choice had been made. A paralyzed workforce will not work. If the labor force withholds their labor, then they hold the power. The risk that they took required them to believe that there was another possibility, another option, another truth. There was plenty of evidence of evil. They were holding out for good. So when I hear that phrase, turn the other cheek, what I hear is a message of faith. Faith that there is another possible outcome and creating a space for that possibility to happen. That does not guarantee a better result. I'm not arguing that believing in goodwill will make good happen. I'm simply arguing for believing in good, believing in possibilities, choosing to put your focus there rather than on the relentless lists we carry of our failures and our insufficiencies. To turn the other cheek after we have been harmed requires the belief in the ability of a human being to change, to choose a different way to deal with their frustrations, to see the light as it were. So let's think about that for a minute. I invite you into a meditative space. Imagine that you are a plant. Choose one that you like. I'll wait just a minute so you can pick one. Now imagine yourself as that plant, solidly rooted and growing. Envision your surroundings. What do you need to grow? What are your ideal growing conditions? Now I want you to turn your flowers or petals or leaves, whatever your plant contains, I want you to turn it toward the sun to feel the warmth and the sustenance that comes from the sun. What happens if the sun is no longer there? If there's no more light, what happens to your plant self? You can answer that aloud right where you are. Nobody will hear you. What happens if the sun is no longer there? What 
does your plant cell feel like when the light is taken away? And now your sun returns. How does it feel when you can see and feel the light again? Does your plant self turn back toward the light? Do you feel relief? Do you have faith in its existence or do you worry that it can be taken away once more? So I invite you to take just a couple of moments to draw in some comfort and some nourishment into your plant self from your sun. And then thank your plant self for helping you out today and come back to the center. Even when we can see the light, we don't always choose it. Even when we feel the warmth, we don't always take it in. We have reasons to doubt the reliability of comfort, to resist giving other people the chance to hurt us again. We have reasons that we hurt ourselves again. So this idea that we could turn the other cheek to believe in the possibility of change, it's not unreasonable that we argue with it. This idea that we turn the other cheek to ourselves, that we give ourselves a chance to feel good, that we trust ourselves to make a different choice, it's not unreasonable that we argue but it is unhelpful. Portia Nelson wrote this poem, an autobiography in five chapters. One, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am hopeless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Two, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault. I, it still takes a long time to get out. Three, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Four, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Five, I walk down another street. The poem is reprinted in the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, where the author Rinpoche writes, the Buddhist concept of reflecting on death is to make a real change in the depths of your heart and to come to learn how to avoid the hole in the sidewalk and how to walk down another street. The fruit of frequent and deep reflection will be that you find yourself emerging, often with a sense of disgust, from your habitual patterns. You will find yourself increasingly ready to let go of them, and in the end you will be able to free yourself from them as smoothly, the masters say, as drawing a hair from a slab of butter. Every tradition, every ethical philosophy has stories about our need to reimagine ourselves and especially our ways of seeing the world. Parables, koans, lessons, theories, scriptures, all of them pointing to the possibility that there is possibility, that there can be another path, another outcome, another choice, another way of engaging with the world. Frederick and Marianne Broussat cite many examples in their book, Spiritual Literacy, but in this section called Shadow, they write, 
The shadow, according to American poet Robert Bly, is the long bag we drag behind us, containing all the dark parts of ourselves that we would like to keep secret. The shadow may include our anger, selfishness, jealousy, pride, insecurity, wildness, or destructiveness. Even though these qualities are an integral part of us, we want to hide them or deny them. Eventually, they get out of the bag when we project them onto others, family, friend, neighbor, coworker, or another race or culture. The spiritual practice involves being able to recognize these elements and deal with them when they make an appearance in our lives. According to Jungian analyst Robert A. Johnson, to honor and accept one's own shadow is a profound spiritual discipline. But it is much easier to demonize enemies and blame things on someone outside ourselves. Nations do this as well as individuals. Not only, if only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn laments. But the dividing line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. How quick we can be to see the worst in ourselves, how quick we can be to see the worst in others, how quick we are to deflect, to strike back, to think there is only winning and losing good and evil, how afraid we become to be honest about our mistakes for fear of losing everything. How close we are to a different truth, a different decision at any moment, and yet we fail to turn toward the sun. Joan Chittister in, in A High Spiritual Season writes, Try saying this silently to everyone and everything you see for 30 days and see what happens to your soul. I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring happiness to you in the future. I'm going to say that one more time before I finish the reading. I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring happiness to you in the future. If we to the sky, we would have to stop polluting. If we said it when we see the ponds and lakes and streams, we would have to stop using them as garbage dumps and sewers. If we said it to small children, we would have to stop abusing them, even in the need of training. If we said it to the people, we would have to stop stoking the fires of enmity around us. Beauty and human warmth would take root in us like a clear, hot June day. We would change. Let me read you that magical sentence one more time. I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring happiness to you in the future. In religious community, we believe in one another, in possibility, until we can believe in ourselves. That is our holy work. Richard Wagamese writes in Embers, in the deep moons of winter, there are stories hovering around us. They are whispered by the voices of our ancestors, told in ancient tongues, told in the hope we will hear them. Listen. In the drape of moonbeams across a canvas of snow, the lilt of birdsong, the crackle of a fire, the smell of smudge and the echo of the heartbeats of those around us, our ancestors speak to us, call to us, summon us to the great abiding truth of stories, that simple stories well told are the heartbeat of the people past, present, and future. What's needed are eyes that focus with the soul. What's needed are spirits open to everything. What's needed are the belief that wonder is the glue of the universe and the desire to seek more of it. Be filled with wonder. 
the Christian teaching to love your neighbor as yourself is first a, a lesson in loving yourself. The deepest self, the deepest love, the taproot of all love is a belief that there is goodness in our beings. Our life's work is to believe it about ourselves just enough that we can believe in possibility. So let's give that Sufi poet Rumi the last word as he so beautifully encapsulates it. I stood before a silkworm one day and that night my heart said to me, I can do things like that. I can spin skies. I can be woven into love that can bring warmth to people. I can be soft against a crying face. I can be wings that lift and I can travel on my thousand feet throughout the earth, my sacks filled with the sacred. And I replied to my heart, dear, can you really do those things? And it just nodded, yes, in silence. So we began and will never cease. May it be so, blessed be. Amen. Love will guide us, peace has tried us, hope inside us will lead the Let us give thanks for all of our musical angels who bring us such beauty and pleasure and joy. You might want to bring your chalice forward. This is the time of waiting. This is the time of darkness. This is the time of coming to birth. And I replied to my heart, dear, can you really do those things? And it nodded, yes, in silence. So we began and will never cease. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time with us this morning. Um, you've already been invited to Blue Christmas next Sunday. We want to remind you that it will not be recorded, that we um, it'll have a different format. It'll be tender and sweet. And we didn't want anybody to have any concerns about tenderness being recorded. So it's not being recorded. It's just a gentle gathering for us to be together.